Then there's California, a podcast featuring members of the California State Senate Democratic Caucus in conversation about their lives, their legislative priorities, policies, and other related issues that help make California exceptional. From the state capitol in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Last summer, the U.S. Supreme Court, with one divided ruling, set aside decades of reproductive rights and freedoms of Americans, particularly American women, who for the past half century have been relying on the protections afforded under Roe v. Wade for access to essential reproductive health care. But California was prepared. A partnership of legislators, providers, and allies immediately triaged together to protect vital access to reproductive health care in the state. There is already a right to privacy guaranteed in the state constitution, but it's not explicitly defined. And those allies knew that they had to go one step further to fortify and protect essential services like abortion and contraceptives. So those same legislators and allies decided to draft legislation to create an amendment to the California state constitution, including language that expressly includes an individual's fundamental right to reproductive freedom. Thus, Proposition 1 was created, placed on the November 2022 ballot, and passed overwhelmingly, with 67% of voting Californians giving it a resounding affirmation. On this edition of Then There's California, we'll revisit the creation of Proposition 1, the historic amending of our state's constitution and the voters' approval to further secure reproductive freedom in California. The ever-fluid, always-changing debate over reproductive rights across our country and the always-present reminder that no matter how robust our state's progressive trends and values, there's always that uncomfortable reality that moving forward, California's enlightened vision continues to always be at the mercy of stifling federal law and closed-minded judicial rulings. For this conversation, we are joined here by two powerhouse California elected leaders who have dedicated their careers and really their lives to the momentum and reaffirmation of values in this state that ensure an individual's freedom to make their own choices about their health, their bodies, and their futures. Proud to have with us again State Senator Nancy Skinner, representing California's 9th Senate District in Northern California, including the East Bay cities of Oakland and Berkeley. Senator Skinner continues in this new legislative session as the chair of the Senate Budget Committee, and here in 2023, she is the new chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus. Never a dull moment for the Honorable Senator from the East Bay. Senator, welcome to Then There's California. Thanks so much. And our Women's Caucus is now 50 members strong. Absolutely. 50 members of the legislature. Definitely worth celebrating. And we are privileged to have Joining us for this conversation, a strong voice for reproductive rights in California, our Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kunalakas. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakas became the first woman to hold that office when she was elected in 2018, and she was re-elected to another four-year term in November of last year. Prior to becoming a constitutional officer in this state, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakas was Ambassador Kunalakas, serving as the U.S. Ambassador to Hungary in the early years of the Obama administration. And in fact, as we speak, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakas is serving as the acting governor Governor of California, while Governor Newsom is out of the state. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor. Well, thank you, Brian. It's great to be with you and always wonderful to be with Senator Skinner. And what a treat and a podcast coup to get two of the busiest elected officials in California in the same room at the same time. And Senator Skinner, inquiring minds want to know the key question, life as a grandma, how you doing? How is Ronan? <laughs> well, it's wonderful to have a grandbaby, though it's uh, to think that I have a granddaughter who is going to have less rights than I did, that to me is appalling. And we are putting every bit of effort in, we all of us Californians and the lieutenant governor included, to fight back on this assault on women. Thank you for sharing that. Lieutenant Governor, welcome. And I guess we can call you acting governor, too. Is that kind of a heady thing to be in charge of the state? For, you know, <laughs> Governor Newsom while? is still the governor, even if he's out of state. But we work really closely together on so many things that, frankly, I'm really proud of the fact that he could leave on business and then take a little bit of time off and know that he doesn't have to worry that when he is out of state, because the fact is the California Constitution does transfer all the authority to the lieutenant governor. But the fact of the matter is that he knows he can leave and everything will keep going. The trains will keep running on. Nothing well, is at risk. And you could do what John Burton, the former pro tem, used to do when the governor would leave the state. He'd author a resolution for his favorite 1950s musician. So you could do an Ella Fitzgerald. You know what? We had a resolution <laughs> yesterday recognizing it as Dolores Huerta Day. Right. So that's great. I'm a huge Dolores Huerta fan. She is one of our 
are living legends in this state. So that was a lot of fun. Well, let's get on to some sobering and serious business here. Looking back at this last year and ahead when it comes to progressive rights here in California, I wanted to get your reflections on the 2022 SCOTUS ruling from last year and where we are now as a state and country with that ruling circa 2023. Senator. Well, I used the term assault on woman. I did not use that lightly because we think about this Supreme Court, not the exact same court, but still the Supreme Court wisely codified gay marriage, allows for gay marriage. That is incredible and important and a very important right. But meanwhile, the one thing that allows women to have full bodily autonomy, they deny They deny by reversing the decision around Roe v. Wade. And then the response by states, because the Supreme Court itself did not make abortion illegal, but they said, let's leave it to states. And the response by these states now in criminalizing women who want to choose to have that bodily autonomy, it's, again, it's appalling. Lieutenant Governor. I I think... You know, Senator Skinner's from Berkeley and a lot of the really early efforts for women to stand up and say, my body belongs to me. I know that I have control over my body. I'm not going to let the government or the people in power who certainly back when Roe was first established, you know, they were not going to let that power infrastructure take that or tell them that they didn't have control when they knew viscerally as a human being that it's their body, their choice. And for 50 years, women have been able to, you know, exercise our rights of control, to have it stripped away. It was, uh, uh, as much as it was just a blistering affront For many women, it was utterly inconceivable that it would happen. Now, for those of us who knew what was happening once, you know, these new members of the Supreme Court, we could see it coming. Even then, it was astonishing that they would go through with it. Let's go back to when the notion of putting Prop 1 on the 2022 ballot came to be considered a necessary reality and your recollections on why we thought it was necessary to actually fortify our state constitution. We have the right to privacy. Why did California feel this need collectively and with the Women's Caucus and others to put this amendment on into the constitution in the first place? Well, a right to privacy is a great thing, except when you have a Supreme Court that basically uses that very concept of your privacy as one of their reasons for overturning Roe v. Wade. So that certainly told us that California's constitution was not strong enough to withstand zealot court justice decisions. And that's why we felt I think, very, very importantly, and it was our pro tem Senator Tony Atkins who initiated putting that on the ballot. Well, I think that the fact that we have these organizations in California like NARAL, uh, the Planned Parenthood leadership in our state, there were lawyers who were thinking about this and working on this. And so, and again, because it was at least a year when it was clear Dobbs was going to go before the Supreme Court to start getting ready. So the coalition of the FAB Council, all the experts from across the state coming together saying, we need to reach out to the legislature, we need to work with the legislature on this package of bills that do everything from privacy to the website to help women navigate it to funding to increase access. And then, of course, the change to the Constitution, it all kind of came as a package to protect women in California and expand access to care. But there's no question that changing the Constitution was the flagship piece of it. And, you know, there was very little, if any, debate. I mean, the language had to be right. But once it made its way into the capital of California, where three quarters of our elected officials in these halls are Democrats and more than that, I think, are pro-choice, it moved along very quickly and was really embraced as the right thing to do. And it just kind of continued to build momentum all the way to the election. Yeah. And our voters overwhelmingly supported it. And for those who might not remember what Prop 1 was, what we did is made it explicit We explicitly gave constitutional protection to the right to an abortion and the right to contraception.
And I would say, Lieutenant Governor, that that overwhelming majority that that symbolized something. It's not just the the liberals and the Democrats and the pro-choice people here in this building, but they represent a pretty diverse constituency of progressive Californians. I think it is at this point just woven into the to to the consciousness of people in our state that bodily autonomy and particularly a woman's right to make decisions over her body but also have her reproductive care within her own hands that the responsibilities of doctors to respond to their patients but also to do what is in the you know make the best health choices uh, we're hearing stories in other states where women are are already dying as a result of an inability to get access if they're losing a child and then can't get the care to handle um, what, you know, because doctors don't don't want to perform what are the, the right medical procedures. So, no, I think it's woven into the way that Californians feel about what is right and what is wrong. But the fact is that when you take a vote like that and you change the Constitution, that's going to impact generations to come. And that's why it wasn't just important that it passed, but that it passed by a very clear, very wide majority. And Senator, there was actually some concern that putting Prop 1 out there was a risk that a narrow victory for that proposition would have put into question our California privacy rights and prompted activists to start pushing ballot initiatives to further weaken those privacy rights and even worst case scenario prohibit abortion rights being amended into our constitution if you were to try it again you know you really needed an overwhelming vote on this what, what's your thoughts on that? Well I think Californians you know um, the lieutenant governor expressed it well I think another way to think of it is that Californians, independent of their own personal beliefs about like whether they would choose to have an abortion, I think they feel very, very strongly that this is a personal decision, that to force a woman to carry a pregnancy against her will, which is what is happening in so many other states, that that is just a, a notion that is really uh, that Californians reject. While they may never choose themselves to to opt for that, they just would not impose such a decision on anyone else. Lieutenant Governor, do you think that that was a, a risk, a gamble out there putting such a direct and albeit controversial proposition out there? So I don't think anyone thought that we wouldn't have the votes for it to pass. But anything like this, of course, is going to be risky. And I was very honored to serve as a co-chair, but you have to have a campaign. And early on, I think there was a feeling that it, the funding would sort of fall into place. But it's difficult to fundraise for things, especially something that everyone thinks is going to pass. So I ramped up my involvement pretty seriously over the summer when there were only a couple million dollars in the bank. And a fully funded campaign had to be somewhere between 15 and $20 million to absolutely make sure that people knew that what they think it is, is what it is. What I mean by that is that this is an area that is so prone to misinformation and for outright untruths to be making their way around the internet that when I saw that the Catholic Church had put a million dollars in uh, to the no campaign, I really felt that we had to step up our efforts. So I called Hillary Clinton and asked her if she would come out and basically cap off a fundraising effort in order to be able to build the necessary resources. And honestly, it was an incredible marathon of about six weeks of calling everybody everywhere across the state that I could, a lot of foundation support. And again, it isn't that just the reality of how politics work is you can put something on the ballot through the legislature, but if the general public doesn't see anything, it is prone to misinformation. So the campaign was fantastic. They went into communities in foreign languages where it was hard sometimes to penetrate just to make sure that everybody knew what it was. And then, of course, the governor did some great ads that people saw. But to me, if it was polling at almost 70 percent, it had to pass at almost 70 percent for a lot of reasons like what I just stated, but mostly because other states who look to California to do so much 
If they said, well, it polled at 67, but it only passed at 57, and our margin in our state is less than that, other states might have backed off. So it was a Herculean effort, and I think one that a lot of people in this state can be proud of. And, of course, the tricky thing about propositions on a ballot is people can just skip them over. And so the lieutenant governor's point about we needed to bring attention to it, we needed people who wanted to vote yes to no to vote yes because the motivation by the no vote was going to be greater. So it's really, really good that there was a campaign. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, you used the term Herculean, and California has also, since last year, engaged in this Herculean and humanitarian effort in securing and funding and promoting its status as a sanctuary state for women seeking abortion services from other states where their rights are less, punitive restrictions on reproductive rights. Talk about the significance of that from last year and moving forward of California's role as a sanctuary state in the wake of those restrictive laws that are popping up all over the United States and how our state's values become that much more important to women from other parts of the country. Well, we're an inspiration, but also, let's be practical, we're a refuge. And Lieutenant Governor pointed out this group, the FAB Council, that's the Future of Abortion Council. It's an incredible coalition of many, many reproductive justice organizations who came together and the Women's Caucus worked with them. And last year, we passed over 15 bills that were signed into law that expanded abortion access, expanded contraception access, supported the health practitioners, provided legal protections, provided funding for women who may need to come here from another state, did all of that. But of course, we found even additional work that we need to do now to shore up and protect medication abortion, for example, with this recent Texas decision, and to do further privacy things, because unfortunately, you could use a period app, and it would track on your phone when your period is happening, and you could live in Texas, and they might then try to, if you came to California, they might try to use that information from your phone to prosecute you. And so we wanted to make sure sure that that information could not be accessed from phones and that you would be protected legally in California. A practitioner was protected, a patient was protected. So all of those things, we not only passed laws last year, but we have a whole nother set of laws that we are trying to get through this year. And yes, I think and we'll be and with the attorney general's help as whether it's a pretty aggressive package yes, last year aggressive. and this year. Yes. Your, your response on that? Well, it, it's just fantastic what the senator and her colleagues are doing. I, I will tell you, as a former United States ambassador, someone who represented our country overseas, it doesn't make me happy that California is in a position where we have to provide sanctuary to other American women. It shouldn't make anybody happy. But if we have to do it, then that's what we're going to do. And what does give me hope in light of the Dobbs decision, the response to the Dobbs decision through the election process and the response to this court case in the last few days out of Texas, is that regardless of political party, women and many men across the country are standing up and saying, this is not right enough. And so for as long as we need to continue to do the work to be a sanctuary, we must do that. But we also need to provide that encouragement to people across the country to stand up and say this is being driven by a minority of zealots, zealots. zealots. Mm -hmm. who yes. are trying to throw women back into the Stone Age or the Medieval Age in terms of our role in society, and we are not going to stand for it. And you have said in the past, you know, democracy is a work in progress. This speaks as much to democracy issues and our threat to it as it does just to the specific bills and the specific policies. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, if this were just purely based on a popular vote of Americans, none of this would be happening at all. The row would continue to be in place. Abortion rights and, would, yeah. Americans support the right to an abortion. That's what all the polls show. That's exactly right.
In February, Governor Newsom announced the formation of this 20-state coalition to protect and expand abortion rights, funded by two California philanthropic organizations, I believe, technically nonpartisan, although I think most of the states are led by Democratic governors. There is an independent governor. There we go. That's good. So how useful or effective will this coalition be, and how useful is it turning out to be, particularly in regards to these recent rulings on abortion medication and trying to secure access to that medication and share it with other states? Senator? Very effective. Well, right now we're facing these two competing decisions. You've got a decision in a federal court in Washington by a Washington judge that says the FDA approval of MIFI, the uh, medication drug in question, medication abortion drug in question, is completely legitimate and fine. And then you've got this Texas judge that the anti-abortion forces, they shopped. They did it. They picked this guy purposefully because they knew that he would rule. And I mean, he has no science background, no medical background, and yet he decides that FDA approval is not accurate. So meanwhile, the states, including California and California being some of the initiators of it, are stockpiling the drug that it remains legal regardless of what judge prevails and is still very effective as a medication abortion. That's MISO. That one's available. We're stockpiling it. And we're also, all of those states are fighting back, supporting the Biden administration to basically support the FDA. And there's real the real united effort to make sure that medication abortion stays available. Yeah. Lieutenant Governor is a leader of the state. What do you think of this partnership, this coalition? Well, uh, again, I agree 100 percent with what the senators just said. I, I will say that we're seeing more and more a circumstance where Governor Newsom has been working together and leading, frankly, with other governors who have populations who feel as strongly about these issues as we do. We saw it during COVID with the COVID response. We saw it during the Trump administration around the Paris Climate Accords and now this. It is important and it is unfortunate that we're seeing these divides in our country, but we have to do what we can to organize and find our partners across the country to fight back because our very existence when we talk about climate change, but our very rights as human beings when it comes to bodily autonomy are really at risk right now. And so being able to work collaboratively with other governors is is extremely important and hopefully we'll be able to prevail across the country and at the federal level. And Governor Newsom's leadership has been essential to yes, it. Essential. Indeed. Final question here before we wrap. The Dobbs decision and the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which is hard to believe, in January has led many women to reflect further on their rights to privacy or on how abortion has possibly changed their life. And after Roe, many women believed that the era of backroom abortion was gone, that the choice was celebrated, and they couldn't imagine a society where rights, once granted, could be taken away. And yet, in 2023. Women are scared. Doctors are scared. Lawmakers are scared. Talk about that fear as elected officials, as mothers, as a grandmother, and some assurance to women that are dealing with this moving forward. In so many ways, it feels as though the right has figured out how to game our democracy in order to get outcomes that are clearly not in line with what the majority of Americans feel. That's the reality on the ground. And California stands as a beacon or a haven, I think, for so many of the rights that we have come to enjoy, whether it's women's rights or LGBTQ rights or, you know, focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, so many, so much of the progress of the 20th century, now the 21st century, that the right is trying to roll back. We're a very important symbol in the country and in the world. And I will just say, as the Lieutenant Governor of California, I am the President of the Senate, which means I only vote if there's a tie. And there's never <laughs> a tie right. because the Democrats are overwhelmingly. That's but right. But to be part of a state government where we are all working collaboratively to protect against this sort of lock picking, gaming approach of the right as they did with this Texas decision, that's powerful. And it's powerful enough, I believe, 
to be able ultimately to prevail because public opinion is on our side and we just have to believe it, right? And people say, can you believe, can you believe? We have to believe this is what they're doing and we have to use all the tools at our disposal in order to fight back and protect our people. Senator Skinner is the chair of the Women's Caucus. Fear, I'll give you the last fear word Fear can be paralyzing. And I think that is much of the anti-abortion forces intent. When we look at those states that have passed laws that basically have an exception, that if you were raped, for example, or if you have a, a medical, you know, your health is at risk, that you could get an abortion. And yet we're seeing and reading all the time about women who try to get a doctor to give them that exemption and they can't get it. So then this terrible fear. And again, it's this paralyzing. But I think we have to take the fear, which we are doing, and which I, I find inspiration across the country with other people doing also, take that fear, put it into anger and action, not just anger, but action. So do things like Wisconsin vote that approved a Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin right. that is going to uphold right. these rights instead of reverse them. And we're, we're seeing it across the country. And let's just keep it going. Let's keep that momentum. Thank you both for your time. I'm sincerely privileged to have both of you here to discuss this with your leadership collectively here. I know California is in great shape. Thank you, Senator. Always glad to have you back. Hope we can do this again (laughs) soon. Lieutenant Governor, it's really a pleasure. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. State Senator Nancy Skinner from the Knight Senate District in the Bay Area, the chair of the Senate Budget Committee and the Legislative Women's Caucus, and the Honorable Eleni Kunalakis, the Lieutenant Governor and sometimes the Acting Governor of the State of California. And that is a wrap for this edition of Then There's California production of the California State Senate Democratic Caucus with technical assistance and production support from John Roman, Brian Shadden, McClenna Woods, Anne DeGrazia, Michelle Baker, and the graphic artistry of Tim Davis. I'm Brian Green at the State Capitol in Sacramento. Thanks for listening to Then There's California.